questions because when you encounter Hebrews you hear different pronunciations especially in the black conscious community uh, the Hebrew Israelite faction you hear that there's different pronunciations in regards to uh, vocalization or vowels right or phonetics right so what I'm going to do is that I'm going to go in for you and show you guys um, some of the, the phonetics now this presentation is mostly to be able to read and decipher the text it's not really going in pronunciation because pronunciation is a totally different element you feel what I'm saying so this is pretty much designed for you to be able to be literate. And I'm going to show you uh, certain elements as you progress forward, all right? So dealing with the vowel system, we want to know what are the different pronunciations in the Hebrew Israelite community in regards to phonetics when dealing with the Hebrew language, all right? So let's move forward. All right, now when it comes to vocalization, we have one method that's called the Palestinian, right? And again, if you look here, you'll see that we have the manuscript here. This is from the Geniza Cairo manuscript. And uh, the Palestinian vocalization is the Eretz Israel, or the Palestinian vocalization, or Eretz Israel Palestinian pointing, or Eretz Israel Palestinian Nakud, is a system of diacritics devised by the Masoretes of Jerusalem to add to the consonantal text of the Hebrew Bible to indicate vowel quality reflecting the Hebrew of Jerusalem. The Palestinian system is no longer in use, having been supplanted by the Tiberian vocalization system. The Palestinian vocalization. Um, reflects the Hebrew of Palestine by at least the 7th century CE when it went out of common usage. A common view among scholars is that the Palestinian system preceded the Tiberian system but later came under the latter's influence and became more similar to the Iberian tradition of the Ben Asher school. All known examples of the Palestinian vocalization come from the Cairo Geniza discovered at the end of the 19th century although scholars had already known of the existence of a Palestinian pointing from the Mazar victory. In particular, the Palestinian um, Payyutim generally make up the most ancient of the texts found, the earliest of which date to the 8th or 9th centuries and predate most of the known Palestinian biblical fragments. So when you look at these manuscripts, and the Geniza Cairo is one of those manuscripts, or the Cairo Geniza manuscripts, or one of the ones that I showed um, in part one, you'll see that when you're looking at the manuscripts, the diacritic marks are much different than the Masoretic text. The diacritic mark for the Palestinian vocalization system is right above the consonants. And if you look here, you'll see that the Batah Hamet is uh, located with a dash right above the consonant. Um, you'll see that you have the Segol Zere. It's, little, it's slightly different right above it. You'll see here for the Herik, it looks like a Shiva that you would see in the Masoretic text, but it's right above it. The Halam, again, looks like a Segol, but it's right above it. And you have another Kubat and Saruk, which gives you the U sound. So you have the A, E, E, O, and U sound, and these are all in the Palestinian vocalization system that's used in some of the manuscripts, such as the Genizo um, Cairo manuscripts, all right? So I want you all to understand that. So when you're looking through, like me, I have a whole uh, microfiche of all these manuscripts. So I go through all of these manuscripts, and I have to identify how to vocalize what it is that I'm reading. So I'm giving you guys information as well. So we go to number two. All right, the second system is called the Babylonian vocalization system, right? The Babylonian vocalization, also known as the Babylonian superlinear punctuation, or Babylonian pointing, or Babylonian Nukud Hebrew is a system of diacritics, Nukud, and vowel symbols devised by the Masoretes of Babylon to add to the consonantal text of the Hebrew Bible to indicate the proper pronunciation of words, reflecting the Hebrew of Babylon, right? The Babylonian system is no longer in use, having been supplanted by the Tiberian vocalization system. We've seen that a lot. The simple Babylonian vocalization system was created between the 6th and 7th centuries, while the complex system developed later. There is evidence that the Babylonian Hebrew had emerged as a distinct dialect by the end of the 9th century. Babylonian Hebrew reached its peak in the 8th and 9th centuries, being used from Persia to Yemen. Under Muslim hegemony in the 10th century, the main academies disappeared and the Babylonian vocalization system was replaced by that Tiberian vocalization. Again, when you look at the migration patterns of these people, where the rabbis and sages was, and what was occurring in history at the time, you understand why this was the case. And it says, as represented in the Babylonian system, the first example of the Babylonian vocalization to become known to modern scholars was the Codex of the Prophets discovered in 1839 at Hufut Kyle, right? And again, this is another fragment I pulled from the um, Cairo Geniza manuscripts. You'll see again the Nakud dot or the diacritic marks are located above the consonants. And if you look here, 
We have an explanation of that here. The Batax, the Go, is a marker right above. That's the Asal, the Chametz right here. Same thing right above. The Zere, the Hedek, the Halam, the Chabat, the Shiva. So all the Palestinian and Babylonian vocalization system have the A, E, I, O, and U that you would have in English. Again, this is a later, later system, vocalization system, all right? Now, the most common one is the Tiberian, which I'm about to touch on right now. Tiberian Hebrew is the canonical pronunciation of the Hebrew Bible or Tanakh committed to writing by Masoretic scholars living in the Jewish community of Tiberias in ancient Judea, 750 to 950 CE. They wrote in the form of Tiberian vocalization, which employed diacritics added to the Hebrew letters, vowel signs and consonant, consonant diacritics, or the Nuchudat, and the so-called accents, right? These together with the marginal notes, the Masara Magra and the Masara Parva make up the Tiberian apparatus. Though the written vowels and accents came into use only at 750 CE, the oral tradition they reflect is many centuries older with ancient roots. The Tiberian vocalization um, is devised by, was devised by the Masoretes of uh, Tiberius to add to the continental text of the Hebrew Bible to produce the Masoretic text. The system soon became used to vocalize other Hebrew texts as well. The Tiberian vocalization marks vowel stress and makes finer distinctions of consonant quality and length and also serves as punctuation. While the Tiberian system was devised for Tiberian Hebrew, it has become the dominant system for vocalizing all forms of Hebrew having long since eclipsed the Babylonian and Palestinian vocalization systems. So this you would get mostly when you deal with the newer text, which is the Masoretic text, which is mostly we have the Codex and the Aleppo text, and those Codex and Aleppo manuscripts are what's in major use right now. This is where you have a lot of the major Bibles until the discovery of the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, where they started to use that as an Old Testament uh, Tanakh translation. Um, but as you can see here, we start to get to the more modern, where the diacritic marks are right underneath the consonants. And you have right here the typical Patach, the Sagal, the Zere, the Hedek, the Kametz, the Cholam, the Chabutz, the Shurik. A, E, I, O, U, etc. You'll see it here. And here's another example of a, a microfiche from a manuscript that I grabbed for you guys. So you can see the pointings is at the bottom. So now we started in the Babylonian and Palestinian vocalization systems at the top. And then we end it now at the bottom as time progressed and as you had different scribes who actually marked the text. So the reason why I'm showing you this is that when you hear brothers pronunciate in the street, when they go in in regards to the Hebrew, when you see them on YouTube, when you go to a temple, you'll understand which vocalization systems that they're utilizing so that way you understand which Tanakhs that they're utilizing, okay? So let's move forward. All right, here again, the Masoretic text that are critic marks, and this is all based on a Tiberian vocalization system. So everything that is being used now in regards to pronunciation, you hear right now, you have the Chametz, uh, which gives you the long I sound, you have the Zeri, which gives you the E sound, the Hedek, which gives you the I sound or the I sound, the Cholom, which gives you the O, and you'll see that these indicate a long pronunciation, short pronunciations, is the Batak, is a short A, Zagol is a short E, Hedek is a short I, and you have the Kametz, which is a short, um, Kametz, I'm sorry, Hatof, which is an even much shorter pronunciation of the A, and the Chavot, which is the U, again, a much shorter indication of the U. Half reduced short in duration, again, the Hataf, Hataf, the Hataf, the Go, the Shiva, which also can be a pause and pronunciation, the Hataf Khamet. Again, looking at this, this is all from the Masoretic text, and this is all from the later manuscripts, and these will contain or where you have a lot of the Old Testament translated from along with the Septuagint, all right? Let's move forward. Now, the Matres Lectionis, right? This is another method of vocalizing or vowel pronunciation, right? And I went over this in the uh, previous one, so I'm not going to go too much into it because it's already in a previous one. But I want to show you the Matres Lechonis in the spelling of Hebrew and some other Semitic languages. Matres Lechonis, um, it says, refers to the use of certain consonants to indicate a vowel. So they double as a consonant and vowel when you look at it as an infix, right? It says, the letters that do this in Hebrew are left, he, wav, and yud. The yud and wav in particular are more often vowels than they are consonants. And Arabic, the Matres Lechonis, all right, are alif, Wow and Yah. It says, because the scripts used to write some Semitic languages lack vowel letters, unambiguous reading of a text might be difficult. Therefore, to indicate vowels, mostly long, consonant letters are used. The earliest method of indicating some vowels in Hebrew writing was to use the consonant letters Yod, Wav, He, and Aleph of the Hebrew alphabet to also write long vowels in some cases, all right? And if you look here at the bottom, it says here, it says, uh, in pre-exilic Hebrew, which is, which is what I deal with, there are, was a significant development of the use of the letter He, 
uh, to indicate word final vowels other than e and uh. My thresh electronics are found in Ugaritic, which I'm good with too, and I'm going to share that in a later presentation. Moabite, South Arabian, and Phoenician letters, but are widely used only in Hebrew, Aramaic, Syriac, and Arabic. So what this means is that in the more pre-exilic Hebrew, before they were influenced by the Aramaic when it was in Babylonian captivity, they were using a system of writing where they did not have the diacritic marks or the nechudat. So what they did was they had a system of when they elongated a pronunciation such as a, ah, e, eh, and u, uh, they would use infixes, right? Mostly yud and, and uh, wav. The wav will give you the up uh sound. The yud will give you the it sound. And then you have at the end, which is the a, ah, which will also indicate the feminine principle. And then you have the prefixes, right? Which is the aleph, which also can give you an a. Ah. This was the pre-exilic Hebrew and also pre-exilic Semitic pronunciations before the diacritic marks got involved when they were making it more a easily accessible to the masses and to the other cultures. So this right here is another vocalization system. This is the one that I'm particularly uh, used to. This is the one that I utilize because again it deals with pre-exilic Hebrew and this is like this is my favorite one here. Now let's move forward, right? Now the La Sharan Quadesh You'll see a lot of Hebrew brothers that's on a corner in a lot of these camps, right? They say, Kwam Yasharala, uh, Barak Atha. They say all these different words. You don't hear any E, uh, U. Um, the only time you hear an I is when they pronunciate the Ayin and Yahawashai. You don't hear a lot of I, E, um, O, U's. You don't hear any of that. So what they use is they use a system uh, where the Lashawan means tongue and Kadesh means holy. The Lashawan Kadesh is translated as holy tongue. This vocalization system was popularized by black Hebrew Israelites in America in the 20th century. The premise for this method is derived upon the fact that since Paleo-Hebrew, which a lot of our brothers uh, in the Hebrew community that you see preached on the corner that they use, um, did not utilize vowel points, this indicated that only one vowel sound was used, ah. This method relies upon reading the Paleo and modern Hebrew text without the diacritic marks. It is the vocalization system of choice by most black Hebrew Israelite camps in America today. So make sure y'all understand that, because if you look here, this is the Pele people which they utilize, right? They have the Aleph is a A, the Be is a Ba, Ga, Da, Ha, Wa, Za, Ha, Ta, Ya, Ha, La, Ma. Then you, again, you have all of these A sounds. The Zere is a Taza instead of Zere, all right? You have Tha, you have Sha. So this is the vocalization system that they use where they only use the A sound, right? And again, you'll see it in the Hebrew here too. Also, I got this here, I got from a um, IHUPK um, uh, pamphlet that actually goes in on it. And again, it reveals here to you, again, the Lashawan Kardes. So that way you can understand the pronunciation system that was more in use by uh, black Hebrew Israelites in America. You get more of just the I, with only the I coming in the I in. All right, so keep this in mind. When you hear brothers speak, you know what vocalization system that they're utilizing, all right? And this is most of the camps. Especially a lot of the camps that came out of One West because this was taught mostly by the Chosen Seven that came from out of the Commandment Keepers. They use this system of pronunciation because they say it's more, um, and it's more antiquated. And this is why they use this system so they came up with this vocalization system, alright? Alright, so we're going to move forward because I went through a lot of this before. So we're going to get to the suffixes. Alright, suffixes. Why is suffixes important when you look at words in Hebrew or when you read words in Hebrew? Because they indicate and they allow you to identify gender and number. All right. When you see a kamet and a hey at the end of a word, it indicates a feminine singular. When you see a hitik underneath a consonant, and then you see a yud and a mem, that indicates a masculine plural. When you see a halam and a tav at the end, it indicates a feminine plural. And if it's not modified, it's automatically a masculine singular. Okay. Possessive constructs. When you have a patach and a tav, and that indicates uh, it changes a singular feminine noun to a construct of which indicates possession. When you have a zere underneath the last consonant and a yud, it changes the plural masculine noun to the construct form of. So this modifies it to the possessive meaning of. All right, and we have uh, examples here, Torah, Moshe, which means the Torah of Moses. You have Shifre, Kadusha, which means books of holiness, right? Let's move forward. All right, pronomial suffixes, identifying the person, right? You have person, gender, and number in Hebrew, right? So in order to identify singular nouns, when you have a hef and a yud that comes at the end, it indicates first person singular possessive such as ma. When you have shiva and a final kaf with a kamet right here, it indicates a second person singular masculine possessive indicating your. 
When you have Zene in the final half with a Shiva, it indicates a second person singular feminine possessive. Your, again. When you have a Cholam at the end, it indicates a third person singular masculine possessive. When you have a Chamet at the end of a consonant, and then you have a He with a Mapik, it indicates a third person singular feminine possessive, meaning her. When you have a zere and nun with a shuruk at the end, right, this combination indicates a first person plural possessive indicating our. All right, let's move forward. Plural nouns. When you have a patach and a yud at the end, indicates a first person singular possessive indicating my. All right? Um, and my, again, can also indicate plurality. We like my house, my things, right? When you have a sago, a yud, a final chaf, and chamet, indicates a second person singular masculine possessive your. When you have a batach, a yud, with a shirik, or herik, and final kaf, and shiva, right here, as indicated here, that indicates a your, which is a second person singular feminine possessive, right? And we're going to see some examples of this. When you have a kamet, a yud, and a wav, right here as a combination, it indicates a third person singular masculine possessive. When you have a kamet, a yud, and a wav, together, it indicates a third person singular masculine possessive, as in his, all right? Let's move forward. I have some examples on a, on a side, but I'm not going to read it because we're pressed for time, all right? But you'll be able to pick this up when you actually look at the manuscripts and be able to identify person, be able to identify plurality, etc. All right? When we have a sago, a yud, and a he with a chamet at the end, it indicates a third person, singular, feminine, possessive, as in her. When you have a zere, a yud, a nun with a shurik at the end, it indicates a first person, plural, possessive, as in our. When you have a zere, a yud, a ha, and sago with final mem as a combination, it indicates a second person plural masculine possessive, as in your. When you have a zere, a yud, a ha, and sago with final nun combination, you have that indicates a second person plural feminine possessive. When you have a zere, yud, he, with sago and final mem, you have a third person plural masculine possessive, as in there. When you have a chamet and final nun, at the end, this combination indicates a third person plural feminine possessive as in your. And again, when you read the text and you look at these indicators, again, these are indicators, modifiers, so you understand person, number, and gender. That's very, very important in Hebrew. And mostly, this is easier to pick up when you're looking at the Masoretic text that has these Naku dot or these diacritic marks. When you go to the more of the Paleo Hebrew or even the ancient Semitic, they don't possess these things, so you have to be able to pick up trends and the language, all right? So let's move forward. All right, verb conjugations. When you modify verbs, right, you have what's called a perfect tense, which indicates a completed action, and you have an imperfect tense, which indicates an incomplete action. So incomplete action can be something that started sometime in the past or the present, but it has not yet been completed, all right? And you'll see this in a lot of prophecies that talk about things that are to come. When you have perfect tense, it indicates something that's completed. In English, it would be the ED, past tense, possible, right? In uh, Hebrew, you have what's called a future tense. You don't really have a present tense. Uh, it depends on the context of what's being said, but it's mostly future tense and past tense in Hebrew. Now, to identify a perfect tense or a completed action in Hebrew, when you have a chametz and hey at the end, it indicates a third person feminine singular as in she did, past tense. When you have a tab and a convex at the end, it indicates a second person masculine singular, which is you did. When you have a tab and a shva at the end, it indicates a second person feminine singular as you did. Again, completed action. When you have a shurk at the end, it indicates a third person plural as in they did. When you have a tab, a sago, and final men combination, it indicates a second person masculine plural as in you did. When you have a tab with a sago and final nun, it indicates a second person feminine plural, as in you did. When you have a nun and shuruk, it indicates a first person plural, as in we did. And these are all completed actions, past tense in Hebrew, okay? It doesn't have the same abstract version of time that you have in the Hellenistic system in the Indo-European languages, right? So this is how you know this is more of an Aboriginal indigenous language because they dealt with the immediate environment and it was only concerned in actions that were either complete or something that was to come. So uh, the, pat the present, is still ongoing, it has not been completed yet, so they will use a lot of the present and the future tense, unless it's something that just happened, all right? So identify completed and incomplete action, which is the imperfect tense. Again, in English, it would be the future tense. When you see a hitic, uh male at the end, it indicates a second person feminine singular, which is you will do. When you have a hitic 
I'm sorry, a cholom at the end indicates a third and second person masculine plural they will do or you will do depending on the context. When you have a nun with a kametz and a hey combination at the end, it indicates a third and second person feminine plural as in they will do or you will do. So again, what I'm doing is I'm giving you all the tools that you need to decipher the majoritic text when you go back to look at these manuscripts and therefore you'll be able to be literate to understand. Again, this uh, presentation was not to teach you how to pronunciate the language because you have rules, you have rules, you have uh, certain different ways that things are pronounced, emphatic marks, etc. So I didn't go on vocalization. This is just designed so you can read the manuscripts, all right, and be able to decipher it, all right? All right, so the next thing is verb stems, which is also very important because you got to look at how verbs are modified. So let's move forward, all right? Now, you have what's called the basic root, which is the cow stem, which is a simple active voice. That means the subject is doing the action with no modification. And most verbs have the cow stem, which indicates a simple action, right? But when we want to look at here, when you look at, when you read Hebrew, you have different ways that the verb is modified, indicating if, if either the subject is being acted upon, if something is done, or if he's performing the action, all right? And this is where you look at the verb stem, because it indicates what the subject is doing, who's he doing it to, if he's doing it to the object, or if he's doing it to himself as the object, all right? You have the active, reflective, and the passive, all right, verb stems. The pa'al, okay, is a simple active voice, similar to the ka'al, right? The pa'il is more of an intensive active voice, and the hefil is more of a causative, and I'm going to get into that in the, the next part at the bottom. The reflective is the hispa'el, which means it's the reflective. The action is being done to the, uh, to the subject. All right? The passive is the hukfa'el, which is more of the causative passive. The pu'al, which is the intensive passive. And you have the nifal, which is the simple passive verb. All right? So all of this is very important, and you're going to see some examples in that later on. Uh, I don't know if I'll be able to finish this presentation today because I don't want to um, take up too much time because we're going to have some guests coming. But I'm trying to get as much as I can. Now, an example of this, you have the katal. Katal means to slay or kill, and it's Strong's number 86991. All right? So if you look in the verb stem, the kyle stem, all right, you have the katal, right, which means he killed. When you have the simple passive, right, you have the hirik, the shiva, and you have the tak at the end, you have what's called the he was killed. So the nifel means he was killed. The action is being done to him. And that's when you have a nun as the prefix with a hirik underneath. And you have the nit katal right here, right? Katal, right? When you're doing he slaughtered, it means he did an intensive action, right? Because you have the causative, the simple, the intensive, and the causative. He slaughtered, which means it's an intensive, right? You have here, you got to look for the identifying marks at the bottom, which is the hirik and the patak. And you have what's called kit. Tal, right? Which means he slaughtered. Then you have the he was slaughtered, which is the passive, means the action was done to him, and that's the intensive. And you have here the kabutz here, the kabutz and the hirik. And that gives you the intensive passive, which is the kutel, right? He was slaughtered. Then when you have what's called the hifel, which is the causative active voice, he caused to kill, he caused something to be done, all right? You have the head with the hirik underneath. And then you have the kal, which has the shiva underneath. And then you have the herik underneath the um, tal, which is the tav. And then you have a yud infix there with the lamed, right? So that's he, ke, talil. And that indicates he caused to kill, right? He caused to be killed, which means he acted on the object and caused the action to take place, which is the causative passive voice. You have the kamet underneath the he, which is the ha. Then you have a shiva right here, which is underneath the katal, and you also have the batak underneath the tab and the lamed, and that right there, an indicator marks, lets you know that he caused an action to be done to something else, or even to himself. Then you have the intensive reflective, which means he killed himself or committed suicide, and that's the notion when you read the text. Again, the indicators is the hit pile. When you say hit, you have the hay and you have the tab, but you have the f sound for the tab. And that means that he did the action to himself. He committed suicide. Look at the indicators. The ha with the hitik, and you have the tav with the shiva at the end underneath. That means you don't give it any pronunciation. It's really a pause. But these are indicators that let you know that he killed himself or the action was being done to himself. He did the action to himself. 
These are all very important when you read Hebrew because Hebrew is a very action-oriented language. Even nouns are verbal nouns that indicate action that has been modified to be a noun to indicate a person. And this is totally different from the Hellenistic or English mindset, all right, that deals with more abstract things and they focus more on the subject, but Hebrew, like indigenous languages, focus more on the action or the verb and who's doing it, all right? Let's move forward. Adjectives, I'm going to go on that real quick for you, all right? So an adjective, an adjective is a word that provides description to a noun. For instance, the Hebrew word for good, which is tov, is a common adjective that can be found in the following phrase, meaning good day, which is yom tov, right? And as you can see here, yom tov. This is very simple. You don't really see anything change or anything like that. Why? Because the adjectives always follows the number and it always follows the person in regards to, uh, I'm sorry, the gender in regards to the noun. Right? So you can always indicate or signify or identify an adjective depending on what the noun. And in this case, the noun is not modified. All right? Now, notice that in Hebrew, the adjective follows a noun which it describes. If the noun is prefixed with the article, article ha, then the adjective will also be as well. Such as we see in the next phrase, meaning the good mountain, which is ha 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 tov, right? And as you can see here, you have the he at the beginning of the adjective and the noun. So it follows the noun, it agrees with the noun, okay? The adjective will also match the gender of the noun. And the last two examples, the words uh, that we have listed down here that I'm about to go in are masculine nouns. Therefore, the masculine form is used. The word for lamb, which is aret or aras, is a feminine word. So the feminine adjective, which we get tova, is used in the following phrase meaning good land. So you'll see that it agrees with it in regards to gender, right? We got it right here. And it's tova, right? So you'll see the hey at the end here, and it's agreeing with it in regards to gender. The adjective will also match the number, singular or plural, of the noun. In each of our previous examples, the singular form of the word, um, the word uh, tov is being used because the nouns it describes uh, are singular. In the phrase meaning good houses, the word house, which is bet or bot, is written in the plural form. Therefore, the adjective has to agree with this. And this is very important when we go later on into uh, the lecture and we see in an actual demonstration of the language why this is important. All right? We have bot yeah. or bot team, yeah. tov right or yin. All right? So you'll see the adjective is agreeing right with the noun. All right? Now, I, I wanted to use this as good indicators or examples of it, but the text is really not that clear because of this. Um, yeah, it's not going to get any clearer than that. Uh, but anyway, I gave you a good uh, estimate. I do understand that the adjectives agree in gender and it agrees in plurality in regards that. to the noun. All right, so let's move forward. All right, direct object. This is also very important with the example that I'm about to give y'all. All right, so let's move forward. What's the direct object? The preposition, right, at play et or et, that would be saying in English, but it's at, and you'll see, or et, we're going to see that in an example, all right, plays an important role in Hebrew grammar. Its most common use is to introduce a direct object. For example, English, I see the book, is in Hebrew, it's row et et ha sefer, which means I see or et the book, so it indicates a direct object is about to take place that's being acted upon by the subject, all right? However, it is only used with the semantically definitive direct objects such as nouns with the proper nouns and personal pronouns is the only time you're going to see it so you're not going to see it preceding an object in every phrase in the text it only is only there when you have a proper noun or a personal noun pronoun I'm sorry personal pronoun which is very very important but semantically indefinite direct objects it is simply omitted altogether you don't have it when it's a indefinite I'm sorry when it's a uh, indefinite article which indicates an A in English. You don't have the A, okay? So uh, it is simply omitted, all right? This has no direct translation into English. In English, we don't have these modifiers or these signifiers or indicators that perceive direct objects like we do in Semitic languages, which is very, very important. And again, you have to learn it from this standpoint to be able to read it. You can't be looking at the Hebrew from an English mindset because if you do, you're going to get kind of jacked up, all right? So when you look at the nouns as direct objects, um, again, well, I'm, I'm going to use this here because, again, this text is really blurred. I want you to really read that for you guys. But notice that in the sentence from Genesis 1 and 1, there are two direct objects as indicated by the two occurrences of the et or et markers, okay? Notice that the second defin definitive direct object marker is prefixed with the conjugative vav, 
which is very, very important. God created what? It indicates what action, I mean, what uh, object is being acted upon by the subject, right? The heavens and the earth. And we'll see that later on. As mentioned in Unifor 6, proper nouns are considered definitive or definite. When a proper noun is a direct object of a verb, you will also see the eighth definitive direct object marker. And examples of that, here's another, some more examples of um, the objects, how to identify objects when you don't have the eighth marker on it. It's here. You'll see here saying that he sent me. You have shel laha ha ni, right? You have shel ha het ka, he sent you, and you have the shel laha o, which means he sent him. And you'll see the indicators at the end. For the him, you have the halam. For the ka, you have the final nun. Excuse me, I'm sorry, final ka for the patak. And in the ni, you have the nun with the hitik and the yud. And that indicates a me. This also helps you to identify the object when you don't have the eight indicating the pronouns or indicating a proper noun, all right? Let's move forward. Majestic Pyro, I'm gonna have to speed this up a little bit because we have one of our guests here and more of our guests are gonna be here shortly. But majestic plurals are very, very important because if you don't understand this concept, when you read the Hebrew, especially when they talk about Elohim, you're gonna be very confused, okay? So this is very, very important. I'm just gonna read this for you and again, in the example, if I get to it, I'm gonna show you it demonstrated, right? The royal we or majestic plural is the use of a plural pronoun to refer to a single person holding a high office or a single entity holding a high office such as a sovereign, i.e. a monarch or sultan or religious leader, alright? The more general word for the use of we to refer to oneself is Gnosticism, right? It's a, or Gnosticism, I'm sorry. However, the use as a majestic plural to denote the excellence, power, and dignity of the person who speaks or writes is the most common one. Speakers employing the royal re refer to themselves using a grammatical number other than the singular, right, in plural or dual form. Several prominent epithets of the Bible describe the Jewish or Hebrew God in plural terms, Elohim, Adonai, El Shaddai. Note that the present biblical text always employs grammatically single verb forms, because remember, the verb has to agree in number and gender to the noun, which is very, very important, all right? Um, and argue that they represent a majestic plural. Similarly, the God of the Quran employs the Arabic pronoun nahu, which means we, or its associated verb suffix in many verses. This is gonna be very, very important when you look at indicators in regards to subjects and actions, and in regards to how they have to agree to indicate whether or not we're reading a majestic plural, or if it's not a majestic plural, all right? Let's move forward, all right? Uh, we can get into numbers. I'm gonna do this. How much time do we have, uh, Sa? Um, keep going until sure. until brother. Uh, yo, get over there, brother. Bro, like, let them see your face. Let them know you're in the building. Oh, no, just let them see your face. <laughs> let them see your face. Yeah. What's up? We got brother polite in the building. Y'all see him. All right, um, All right. you can go. Cause I'm, I'm trying to wait till I get contact from Zion. Is that, oh, you didn't hear from him yet? No, I was calling him. You know, I'm Damn. trying to see what time he coming. All right, what time is he it right now? He might be on the train. That's why I ain't been getting. Okay, what time is it right now? Right there. The time right there in your face. 12, 17, 18, oh. Okay. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So 1220. All right. So looking at numbers again, I'm not going to have this one of the examples I have at the end. You can sit down if you want to like right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I just said, oh, right. I just said, no, no, no. No, it's cool. It's cool. <laughs> All right. So you have numbers here, right? When you're looking at numbers in regards to Hebrew, I have a uh, hash out a uh, chart right here for you guys to see. Uh, we know that Aleph has a numeric value of one. We know Bet has a numeric value of two. Gamel or Ga has a numeric value of three. You have the Dalet, which has a numeric value of four. The He, the numeric value of five. You have the Wab, that has the numeric value of six. You have here the Zayin, the numeric value of seven. You have the He, the numeric, the numeric value of, um, of eight. And then you have the Tet, which is the numeric value of nine. Now, after you get past nine, because zero is not even a numerical value, it just means the absence of a, a, of, of a number, right? Then you have to start to affix the rest of the Hebrew letters to the ones that we just uh, mentioned so that way you can give it a 10, 20, you can get multiples, right? So for example, if I want to indicate an 11, I will affix the Yod, I would prefix the Yod to the Aleph and get an 11. And you do so to the date to get a 12. I will preset, prefix the Kaf to an Aleph to get a, tw to a 21, or I would do it to a Bet to get a, uh, a 22. The Lamed, I would prefix it to an Aleph to get a 31. Uh, the mem, I would prefix it to an I left to give a 40. The nun, I would prefix it to an I left to give a 51. 
Um, I would get the cement, I would prefix it to our left to get a 61. The IN, I would prefix it to the left to get a 71. The PE, I would give a, a prefix it to the left to give it an 81. And the ZARE, I would prefix it to give it a, uh, um, a 91. Now, when you do multiples of 100, now you get into the quaff, you get in the resh and the shin, and then finally the top. And when you add these, you get 401 to the um, left if it's a top. To the shin, you get a 301. To the um, resh, you get a 201, etc., etc. The cough, you get a, a um, 101 when you add it to that left. You get a 102 when you add it to the bet. So you got to look at the prefixes in regards to number. And you'll know number depending on the context of the actual uh, text itself, all right? And I have examples down here, like for example, if you want to do 613, which is the amount of commandments that's actually in the Levitical law, you have a tav, which indicates 400 that we have here, a resh, which gives you a value, you may have a value of 200, and then you would have to fix a yud and a gamo, which is a 10 and 3, and all together you get 613, all right? That's just a short example there. One thing to note, also very, very important, when you look here at the, at the tet, when we go into 10, right, we go into 15 and 16, you don't have the he and you don't have the waf. The reason why you don't have that is because the people who was writing the text were very superstitious in regards to the tetragrammaton, which is the proper name of the Most High. So what they did was, instead of having traditional yud affixed to a he or yud affixed to a waf, all right, because they didn't want it to spell out uh, Yahweh or Yod uh, He Wav He. What they did was they modified it and they added a Tet instead. All right, that's very, very important. So when you go to look for a 16, 17, I'm sorry, a 15, 16, and the text, and you're like, whoa, you know, this doesn't say 16 or 17. Why does it look like that? You understand it's because they were superstitious because they didn't want to pronunciate or pronounce the Tetragrammaton in use of common combination on themselves or having the Gentiles defame the name of the Most High. All right, let's move forward. All right, begin a study in guys. What are the certain guys that I can give y'all so y'all can pick up on the language really well, all right? Uh, an interlinear is always a great tool because it gives you the literal English pronunciation and it's mostly always underneath the Hebrew uh, words, all right? The interlinear Hebrew Greek English Bible is a really good book that you can get if you really want to get started in the language because you start picking up patterns, all right? The ancient Hebrew lexicon of the Bible, which I use some um, elements from that, is also a great reference in regards to ancient Semitic references and the actual lexicons. And like I told you before, how the character of words are displayed based on how they syntax, all right? Strong's exhaustive concordance is also very good because Strong's are key to certain words when you look at the Blue Letter Bible and things of that nature online. The Brown Driver Briggs Hebrew and English Lexicon, which is collegiate, it's called the BDB or the BDL. Uh, this is also a great reference to a great lexicon. A book called The Textual Criticism of the Hebrew Bible is also good because it showed you a lot of the elements that I actually demonstrated uh, in, in real time when you're actually reading the text and it gives you the history in regards to textual criticism. And another good book is The Journey from Text to Translation to Origin and Development of the Bible in regards to the language, the manuscripts, the scribes, what influenced them, etc. These are all great resources. Now, in regards to Bibles, if you want to get a Bible, a lot of my brothers who uh, do come from a lot of the uh, One West Camp teaching, who teaches on the corners, they use the King James, right? Me, I use the King James when I'm colloquially sharing the, the scriptures, but ultimately I use critical edition Bibles. Why? Because a lot of these critical edition Bibles uses other manuscripts, right? And what they do is they give you footnotes, which is very important because it indicates if it's in the original manuscript, if it was a later edition, if it was a scribal era, and you'll see also the different words that are substituted in the actual text itself. Now you have what's called formal equivalency translation and a dynamic equivalency. What's the difference? Do you know what the difference is, Polite? I think Polite knows. Oh, well, I should. I just want to see Polite news. The formal equivalency means they, the translators, when they looked at the text, they did their best to translate it word for word. So that's why when you look at a King James or a New King James or a New American Standard Bible, this is very good if you're doing a word study, right? Because they try to translate everything word for word. So it's almost close to an insulinaire. The problem with this is if you encounter an idiom or cultural expression that is not easily expressed in English when you translate it word for word. That's why when you parallel these critical Bibles with a dynamic equivalency, which is a translation from thought to thought, 
So instead of giving you word for word translating, they looked at the text and said, okay, how can we best convey this Semitic thought into the Hellenistic or English thought? So that's why these are more loose translations. They read more easily and you can get more of the substance because this right here identifies the idioms and it gives you an English translation of those idioms so that we can receive it in our culture today. All how right? much time you got? Huh? How much time you got? I'm almost done. Okay. After this, I got like three slides left. Sign just hit me. He ain't gonna be able to make it. He had his daughter's, um, you know. That's fine. I got it. Yeah. All right. So, a few things to keep in mind about Hebrew sentences. Sentences are read from right. So, he left you in the lion's den. That's fine. That's fine. You know, <laughs> I said, you know why? Just, I'm going to say something funny. It's good to be in the lion's den because then you just got to call me uh, Gabriel. You know what I'm saying? In the oh. lion's den, man. Uh -oh. You know, he shut the mouths of the lions and he got out the next day. So. <laughs> yeah. I'll just mess with y'all, fam. All right, look. So sentences are read from right to left as opposed to left to right in English, okay? The grammar is structured on a verb, subject, object, premise as opposed to subject, verb, object in English. Remember, the Hebrews and a lot of indigenous languages put emphasis on the action, what is being done, before they want to know who is doing it. When you think of the abstract Hellenistic, you'll see here it says the subject verb because the abstract mind wants to know who is doing it. Okay? And this is how you know that the Bible was not written by a Hellenistic mindset because you don't have these Semitic elements in the, in the English Bible when you read it in the original manuscripts, all right? There are variations in guttural, hard and soft, when you pronunciate the words. And again, this is not really important. Um, it's only when you're pronouncing it. What I'm showing you is just indicated so you can identify certain elements when you read the text, all right? So let's move forward. All right. Sentence exercise, all right, fam? We got three slides left, all right? So everything that I just taught y'all from the first part to now, all right, you can slow it down, rewind it if you don't catch it in this time, you'll be able to utilize it and what we're about to see in the next slide, all right? So I'm not just teaching you this, but I want to give you something so that way you can identify it. Now, this is very, very important because I don't see a lot of teachers in the black Hebrew Israelite community that's objective in regards to the different um, translations, whether it's the ancient Semitic, the Paleo, or the modern, which was affected by the Aramaic when they went into captivity, and again, they used it as a language so they can thrive as far as merchant-wise, because that was a lingua franca at the time in ancient Babylon, right? This is why I deal with the pre-exilic Hebrew, which is very, very important before they went into captivity and before things got changed, right? So now we have it here in the ancient Semitic, we have it here in the Paleo, and we have it here, right here, in the modern. Now I'm going to show you some things here. Everybody knows, should know what this is. This is Genesis 1 and 1 in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. You hear that a lot. Then you hear people try to break it down, but now I'm going to show y'all some elements that people don't show you, all right? And I'm going to do this because I want you guys to be able to really get deep into the language, all right? So now, up here, we have a bet, a resh, we have an aleph, right? We have a shin, we have a yud, and we have a taf, right? This can be saying better sheet and better sheet again is using which vocalization system? Yeah, my small pupils are not even paying attention. But uh, the vocalization system that is using there is either the Palestinian, the Babylonian, or the Tiberian vocalization system. When you say better sheet, why? Because they utilize the full range of vowels that we have in English, all right? When you say better shit, which my man Polite likes to use as well, because this is something that was taught by Malachi Z. York, he uses the Matres Lakshonis pronunciation version, which I showed you guys earlier. You have better shit. Why? Because you only utilize an uh, i, and ah, right? And then if we was pronunciating that and the Lashawan Kadesh, which we know was created by the black Hebrews like Kanti in America, yeah. it's only ahs. So you don't have the i, the uh, the e, the ah, you don't have that. So we will read it ba, ra, Okay? Because again, I'm going to show you something that's interesting. Bara sha yat ta, right? Or bara sha rat, right? Or yat. Because a lot of them, they pronounce it kind of differently depending on how they use this yod as an infix, right? So I'm just showing you guys that from going forward, I'm going to speak more using the Tiberian vocalization since that's the most popular, the one that's mostly in use. Um, but I'm going to show you all different elements in these sentences that's normally not pointing out. Now remember, I told you, the ancient Hebrews, pre-exilic Hebrews, were indigenous people that dealt with their environment. They were theological second, but they were more cultural first. And when you understand this, when you look at the text, you won't be thinking about it or seeing it from an abstract or Hellenistic mindset. What do I mean? Well, let's take a look. If we look at this literally speaking, we think this says, in the beginning, which is not true. Now looking here, we have the indefinite article. 
Whenever you don't have ha prefix and ha is the definite article, we're looking at a word that's the indefinite article or a, right? So whenever you have the absence of a ha that's prefixed to a word, it indicates a, right? This is important because this is saying in a beginning. Now you would think beginning, but it's not beginning because beginning is more abstract, it's more Hellenistic, it's more English. When they were pronunciating their words, they were looking at things in their environment. They were not thinking abstractly, they were using their environment. So I'm going to give you an example of that. In a beginning, well why is it in a beginning? Because when a text starts out, it doesn't tell you how uh, uh, the Most High got here. It doesn't tell you how the angels got here because to them that was irrelevant. They were only wanted to focus what affected their immediate environment. So this is why here you have in a beginning, but not beginning, you have here in a summit. The reason why you have the head is because the head, when you're looking at the landscape, a mountain is considered the head because it rises out of the landscape. Just like your head rises up out of your body. And when they look at it, it's an indicative of, for example, if I look at a mountain, we know that a lot of rivers come from the mountaintop, right? So at the peak of the mountaintop, that's called a summit or the start of something, right? It's not thinking abstractly. So that means when the water melts because of uh, the, the um, atmosphere at that temperature, we have the jet streams, we have the warm, cold air, etc., and the water starts to trickle down, this is their identifier in regards to the start of something. They're using the environment to indicate to you that something started. Now, knowing that it started does not mean how it originated. They don't care how the mountain got there. They just want to tell you that we're using this as an example to give you something in your environment to know when something begins or when something starts. So at the summit of the mountain, not the beginning, but at the summit of things, because beginning is too abstract, it can be too inclusive of, of, of just something that we can't, you don't have that's concrete or tangible. So this is actually saying in a summit. Now, um, Zion Lex touched on this, and uh, this word here, uh, Rashid, is also used to indicate wisdom. Why? Because wisdom is at the beginning of things, because the Most High used wisdom to start things. So you can look at it from that, that aspect as well, that's a little bit more abstract, but my methodology is looking at more physical because when you start to look at and analyze indigenous languages, this is how most indigenous languages operate. They deal with things that are in the immediate environment in regards to their culture and not theologically, okay? The next one is bara. So now, we, we identify the indefinite article, which is the first thing I want you to know. The second one is the evolution of the vocalization system from the matres lectionis to the Babylonian Palestinian Tiberian vocalization system. Well, what do I mean? You don't have a lot of people teaching this, but I'm going to show you this, right? Here, in the ancient Semitic, you have bara. This is beit, resh, and aleph, right? Here, Paleo-Hebrew, you have the same thing, beit, resh, aleph, but there's no diacritic marks. Now, watch this, family. You have here, bara. You have beit, resh, and aleph. Notice that there should be no need for an aleph because underneath the resh, there's already an indicator mark, and that's the kamet. Kamet is the elongated a. Now, why is this here, this marker here, if it had nothing to do with the pronunciation. It's because it's showing you that the modern Hebrew has its roots in the ancient Semitic Hebrew because, again, to vocalize an elongated ah, you were adding aleph. See, these were infixes or suffixes that they would add to the language that if you don't look at the ancient Semitic or if you don't look at the paleo, you will not be able to indicate or pick up. This is very, very important. So I want to show you the evolution. Why didn't they get rid of this? Because it kept the element of the word but they still add it underneath the diacritic marks on the because again, when the scribes are writing it in this new vocalization system, they wanted other cultures to be able to read it and they gave them a great indicator. But those of us like me who read the ancient Semitic or the Paleo, we don't need it, okay? Because we understand when you have the ah fixed, it gives you the elongated ah, all right? So that's the evolution of the vocalization system from the matres lectionis, or what some people would say the Lashawan Kadesh, but that's a newer pronunciation. So what we have now, which is the Tiberian vocalization system. Now, I also touched on the summit instead of head or beginning, and I addressed that here. Also, the majestic plural. Now, I like my man. I'm glad Flight is here. Flight my dude. I'm glad Flight is here. Brilliant, brilliant dude, right? But, you know, I have a couple of disagreements with him. And uh, one thing I don't really disagree with him with, but I'm going to elaborate in a later lecture, is when we're dealing with what's called henotheism and monotrism. And if you don't understand what these terms are in pre-exilic Hebrew, then you're not going to understand how this was formulated in the ancient Semitic Paleo or the ancient Semitic script, pictogram script. Now, this is a lesson in itself, but I'm not going to get too detailed with it. But what happened was when um, 
the Hebrew became a political tool and when monotheism was created while they were in Babylonian captivity so that people can have a common religion, common language that was distinct from their captors, they used monotheism as a tool. You start to see this when you look later on in the prophets. For example, you see Isaiah says um, in Isaiah 44 to 46, it says that there's no God beside me, I'm the only God. That is a later rendition because if you look at the Torah, it's much different. The Most High's put an emphasis that he is the supreme God. Henotheism means that you have a pantheon of gods, but you single one out to be supreme. Okay? Monotrism or monotry is when, okay, we know there's several gods. I'm not going to ignore the other gods, but this one is supreme. But because he is supreme, I'm going to worship him alone. Not neglecting that worship can be done for the other gods, but I choose to worship this God that I see as supreme, not neglecting the presence of other gods. This was the pre exilic Hebrew mindset before they went into captivity and things were adjusted as a political tool to keep the people together so they won't be destroyed in the captivity. And I think Paulette will agree with me on that. And anybody, if you do the research, you'll see. Now, in the majestic closer, so what they did was when they redacted the text while they was in captivity, they said, okay, you know what? In order for this to be monotheistic, we have to make some modifiers to the text. And one modifier was the majestic plural because while they were in captivity, they were exposed to other gods that they did not worship. So they wanted to put emphasis on their God and how ultimate that God is. And therefore, you have what's called the majestic plural. Now, remember when I showed you in regards to the language, right? Majestic plural, right? We have here, we have um, better sheep. <coughs> We have here bara, and we have here the aleph, the lamid, the al. We say Elohim. Again, I'm using the Tiberian. Elohim. Why is that important? It's because you don't have a modifier on the verb to match the person and the plurality. What well, matches the person, but to match the plurality of this verb, I mean this noun here. That's very, very important because when you have the absence of, again, a modifier for the verb to agree with the noun, something is going on. And what happens is, again, this is what's called the majestic plural. This was very, very important to note because what they're tr uh, initially trying to say, this is also an Arabic and a Samaritan Pentateuch. If you look at it, any kind of a Peshitta, if you look at it, you'll see these indicators here. And what this is indicating is the, the immeasurability of the Most High God. Again, they wanted to make their God supreme while they were in captivity. So now you have a system called the majestic plural that identifies this, all right? Now, also, we have the direct object particle, right? Again, in grammar, a particle is a function word that must be associated with another word or phrase to impart meaning, i.e., it does not have its own definition. I went through direct articles um, or particles with you guys earlier, and one of them was it. It is there for proper nouns and pronouns, all right? And it's an indicator that the action is being done to these objects, and we see that here. All right, we see it here, the I left in the top, and we also see it here, but we have the wav affix, and the wav indicates and. It's a conjunction. Why? Because the tent pole was designed to hold things together, and that's what the conjunctive and does, all right? So we have here it, which is indicating the object that's being acted upon. We have shamayim, but here we have the he. When you have the he prefix fam, that means what? The. So this is the heavens. Now remember, we don't have that here in the beginning, and when you don't have the he, it indicates what? A, indefinite article. So here we have ha shamayim, right? The heavens. We have wav, and again, underneath that, we have a shiva, that means you don't pronunciate it, it's mostly used as an indicator, and we have va'et. Va'et means and the, again, it's showing you that it's also being acted upon this next um, object, right? Which is here, we have ha'aret. Ha means the, definite article. Why? Because the man with his hands up is looking, beholding a singular sight. He's focused on that one sight that's making him wonder and awe. So we know that we're pointing to or focusing on something in particular. And this is where you get the definite article. And I want to show you all that so you can understand what a direct object particle is that you don't have in English. But when you read the Hebrew text, you can pick these identifiers up. All right? Let's move forward. All right? Now, also, filled or fatted. Now, here we think bara means to create, but bara is abstract, create is abstract. In Hebrew, it's not create. In Hebrew, it's literally to fatten or fill. Well, how do we know that? When you do textual criticism and look at other texts, you'll say, wait a second, this word bara means create here, 
it means fat in here. In Hebrew, they never saw a difference like we do in English. See, they cleaned up a lot of the Hebrew when they did their English translations, and we have to keep this in mind. But in Hebrew, I can read a word in one particular part and see it the same way everywhere else, and it makes sense. Uh, a good brother by the name of Asar M. Hotep, a very great linguist, he uh, was interfaced with Brother Jonathan on one of the boards at one time, and this is something he pointed out to Jonathan, and not to take away from Jonathan's scholarship, because his scholarship is, is pristine, but Jonathan was using the Mark Vegas uh, dictionary, right? And he was using that to break down a particular uh, passage in the Medjunetra. I saw M. Hotep was saying to him, listen, what you're trying to do is make things make sense in English when you're reading these Aboriginal indigenous languages. You don't do that. And the Aboriginal and in in indigenous languages, they never thought that one word can always mean something different everywhere else. For the most part, it kept its correct um, etymon, but if you don't understand this in English, you're going to try to say, okay, well here it means fat, here it can mean create. But if you're not understanding the Semitic mindset behind the language, which is very indigenous and aboriginal to colored people, then you're going to miss this. Why? Let me show you. When you go to 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 29, right, we have here, and again, this is not that clear. Uh, let me see if I can make it a little clearer for the people. All right, well, it's not that clear, but I'm going to read it to you. We have here, right, this says, wherefore, I can't even see that. <laughs> wherefore... <laughs> Uh, ye at my sacrifice and at my offering which I have commanded um, habitation and I don't know, thou see above me is to make yourselves fat. Now here, to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Yisrael my people. Now, why is this important? Because the root word there is bara, but it's highly modified because of the context. Let me show you, right? You have the lame, the word is, the, the word is right here. You have right here the lamed. Whenever you have the lamed prefix, lamed means to or towards, right? Here it says to make. Why? Because with the shepherd's staff, the shepherd would throw his staff out. He would grab onto the hook part of it to the lamb and he would pull them to himself. So that's how you mean it means toward, right? When you have it fixed. If you look at the next indicator, you have the ha, right? You have underneath the ha the patak. Now, this is the indicator that I told you earlier about verb stems, right? And this is going to indicate something, and I'm going to show you guys, right? But then after that, you have the bara, right? You have the bait, you have the re, I'm sorry, resh, or ra. When you have the ba and the ra, it has an infix, which is a yud, and then after the yud, you have the um, alef. Now, it's not saying bara in a stem sense, it's because it's being modified based on the context, and I'm going to show you why. At the end of it, you have the kaf, and you have the mem. The kaf and the mem indicate something. It means your, right? So the lamed means towards, right? When you have the kaf and the mem, it means your, indicating you possessive, right? And then you have bara. Now, if you was looking at it from Genesis 1 and 1, you'll think, oh, it means to make yourselves created, or to make you created. Doesn't make sense. It means to make yourself fat, or your, to make you fat. So when you read in Hebrew, you first look at the prefix, then the suffix, then the infix, right? Because the infix is where you're going to get the lexicon or the definition of the root word, but you have to look for infixes, and in this case, an infix would be the ha, would be here. The ha and the yud, right? That gives you the hifil, and the hifil is doing the action to yourself, and then at the end, you have the kaf and the men. The kaf and the men is indicated of your, possessive. So here, it means to make your that, or to make yourself, and you add self because the action is being done to you. In Hebrew, it's not read that way, but in English, it has to be translated away so you can understand. Why is that important? Because when we go back and we read this again, it says, in a summit, bara means fatten, or he fattened, because again, every verb has a pronoun attached to it. He fattened, or he filled. Listen to this, fam. He filled, or he fattened. You'll be like, what? He fat, so it's not create. Remember, they're not talking abstractly as where did God come from, where the angels come from. They're dealing with things that involve themselves directly. So when we go back and we read the text, and again, I can't really read it, but I'll read it for y'all. It says, Then God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters, listen, which were the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, so the evening and the morning were the second day. So there's a separation. Now look at this. 
Then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. What's happening here? God is separating and then filling. He's separating and the things which he has separated. Now he's filling. He's not creating in the abstract sense. He's filling creation. And we'll see that if we look, um, if we go on, it says, then God said, let the earth bring forth grass. Now he's filling the earth or fattening the earth or expanding the earth. Keep reading. Then God said, let there be lights in the firmament. Now he's filling the heavens that he's separated from the waters and from the dry land. You see how this works, fam? And these are things that you don't see when you first read the language. And if you don't have somebody that's a good teacher, you're not going to see elements like that. And you'll keep thinking that this Bible was written by a white man. But when you don't see the indigenous nature of the language, and when you learn it, you'll be like, damn, that was not written by no white man. That makes sense because us as an indigenous people, we deal with our immediate environment. The person who is a European or the white man, he deals mostly much differently from an abstract perspective. Why? Because in his environment, he didn't have a lot of resources. So he had to think intrinsically like, damn, how am I going to survive? So he had to make all these future plans for accommodation for his family and his tribe. Whereas which you had people that was indigenous that had the wealth or the fatten of the land and they were getting resources. Now they were dealing intrinsically spiritually. They didn't have to think abstractly. And this is why when you had these foreign invaders come in, things started to change because now their disposition was much different. And what they did was they took that scientific or that nature element from the people and gave them back an abstract element, which is religion. Are, are y'all feeling me on this, sir? This is very, very important, all right? So let's move forward. Textual criticism, all right? Last slide. What is textual criticism? So now... I read all the manuscripts. I have hundreds of manuscripts that I sort through, right? Again, from the Dead Sea Scrolls, the, the, the Cairo Geniza manuscripts, from the Septuagint, um, uh, Septuagint, the Samaritan Pentateuch, from the, uh, the Masoretic text, which is mostly the Aleppo uh, codexes and the Leningrad codexes. Uh, when you look at the Nash Papyrus, when you look at all these different uh, manuscripts, you have to be able to compare and contrast them. Why? Because it was written in different regions, they were written by different scribes, the scribes were influenced by different uh, environmental factors, etc. This is very, very important because in order for you to get the original, what the original must have said, you have to compare the different manuscripts that's contemporary to one another. I'm going to give you an example of that, right? Deuteronomy chapter 32 and 8. Now this is another example of what's called henotheism or monotrism, but again, I'll deal with that separately. But when you look here, it says, when the Most High, or al Alion right gave to the nation their inheritance when he divided mankind he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of god ah what's this here hebrew this is benai or bene this is ha elohim benai ha, -el -ha elohim and if you read that here i also have it here this is from i pulled this from the dead seas scrolls um uh, I think it's 4Q22, I'm not mistaken. I pulled the Paleo Hebrew. So you can see the Paleo Hebrew right next to the modern Hebrew. Now, mind you, this Hebrew here uh, doesn't have the diacritic marks because it's mostly the Hebrew that you use when you type from your character system from a keyboard or something like that. Now, why is this important? Well, that's from the ESV, which is the English Standard Version. If we read a different version, the New American Standard Bible, it says, When the Most High gave the nation their inheritance, he separated the sons of man. He set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the sons of Yisrael. Why is that important? We have Bene or Benai Yisrael. You're like, oh, you see, the Bible's tampered with. You have all these translations that don't make sense. Well, I'm about to make sense for you, right? And people who are scholars that do textual criticism, this is a walk in the park. Let me show you the last translation. The last translation is when the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he divided up mankind, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the heavenly assembly. So now you have one that says sons of God, you have one here that says sons of Yisrael, and one here that says heavenly assembly. So when you look at that, you say, wow, they translate in different ways, you see? This is why we can't trust the translations. I'm like, slow down, brother. Are you reading it in Hebrew? No? All right, let me break it down for you to Hebrew. What they were doing was, and the first translation, the ESV, is using the Dead Sea Scrolls. If you look at the New American Standard, it's using the Masoretic text. And when you look here at the NET, it's using the Septuagint. Why is this important? You have to do what's called deductive analysis when you're looking at cultural linguistics. This is very important. This is why I, I subscribe to the Matres like on its pronunciation, which is I, e, uh, and A, uh, because when we look at all the Semitic languages, these are the different pronunciations that they all have in common to let you know that it came from an original source before it was influenced by other languages, right? 
Now, if you look at this, what do all three of these sons of God, sons of Israel, and the heavenly hosts have in common? All right? I just told you here. This is Bene or Benai Ha Elohim. All right? This is right here. This means the sons of the gods. That's what it literally reads. And that's from the Dead Sea Scrolls. The New American Standard from the Masoretic Text says, Bene Yisrael. Listen to what I'm saying. That means the sons of Israel. Then you have here the Enhelion Theos, which means the angels of God. Now, when you do a direct translation of the Septuagint back into the Hebrew, which you can do by looking at, let's say, the Peshitta and the Aramaic, or let's say we go to another one of these texts, it's literally translated as Melachim or Melachim, right? Shell, and you have Elohim, right? Which means the messengers of, the shell indicates the of, messengers of gods. Or we know here this is the majestic plural, which means the one true God, which is the most high, but in its immeasurable essence, right? What do all three of these have in common? I'm going to say it again. Bene, Bene, Ha Elohim, Elohim. Then we have Bene, Yisrael. And then we have Melachim, Shel, Elohim, Elohim. What are you hearing? El. So you hear L in the Dead Sea Scrolls translation, you hear L in the Masoretic text, and you also hear L in the Septuagint when it's retranslated back to the Hebrew, which means that the common denominator is L or Al. Why is that important? Because we know that when you look at the scribes, depending on their locale, because um, you study what's called paleography, and you look at their techniques on how they drew who the scribe was, which you have to question, where were they located, uh, when did they write, what time period this was, you'll see that they all had a common ancestor, which was Bene El, the sons of El. You have to study the culture of the Canaanites and Ugaritic texts to understand who the sons of El was. One of them was the Baal Hadad. And when you study this, you'll understand why the Baal was worshipped aside Asherah, which was believed to be the consort of Yahweh. Again, that's a totally different thing that I'm going to deal with at the time. But when you study this stuff, it does not take you away from your faith. It gives you a more grander understanding of the text. And remember, when they went into captivity, that's when monotheism was included as a political tool to keep the people untainted from the religion of their captors, all right? So L is a common denominator, and that way we know that L was more than likely the original word that was used, and then there was a play on the word, or modifying the word, where you get Israel, then you get Elohim, etc., all right? Now let's move forward. Deuteronomy 32 and 22. Here I'm going to show you something in regards to the Hellenistic and the Semitic um, uh, uh, pronunciations. Now, um, Deuteronomy 32 and um, 22 says, For a fire is kindled in my anger, and shall burn unto the lowest hell, right? And shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. All right? As we look at the um, NASB, which is the New American Standard Bible, it says, For a fire is kindled in my anger, and burns to the lowest part of Sheol, or Sha'ul, which I would say, and consumes the earth with its yield and sets on fire the foundations of the mountains. Why is this important? When we look at this, we're thinking from a more Hellenistic, a more English, and we say, oh, wait, yeah, hell, hell is the abode of the underworld, and that's what fire is at. Well, you know, that didn't develop into really later on the different elements of the underworld. When they thought about hell, or Sheol, and from a Semitic perspective, they're thinking about the abode of the dead, which is mostly an unknown. This is why you'll see a lot of cultures will create this system of spells, or a system of utterances, so they can go through the underworld, because understand, it was something that was unknown to them. They didn't know if they was going to make it or not, but they had a system that said, well, you know what, let's give it a shot, because this was more abstract, and this developed later on as a tool that they utilized for themselves to be divine. This is very, very important. But here, in the Semitic, we have Hades, if you look at the um, Septuagint, and the word Hades is not the same as Gehenna. In the New Testament, you have the word Gehenna that's there for hell. Gehenna was an actual place. It was a valley that was used as to burn refuge, and in pre-exilic um, Hebrew culture, uh, Molech was being, they was using that valley so that way they can burn child sacrifices unto Molech. It was also a place to burn up refuge, etc. So, we're not talking about Gehenna, we're talking about Hades. Hades is the abode of the dead, and it was something that was unknown. This is why when you read the book of Ecclesiastics, it says the dead know not nothing. They're letting you know that we're just referring physically to the people that are dead. They're not in the realm of the living, so what is going on there is what's going on there. They didn't really create a real intricate system of what hell was or what the underworld was. You have other cultures that did it and perfected it, such as ancient Kemet, right, or Sumeria, all right? Now, why is this important? It's because if we look here in the Hebrew, the word Sheol, in Hebraic thought, just means the literal grave or the abode of the dead. When you get buried, they believe this is where the dead is at. They're in the ground. 
So this is not putting any abstract nature to the words. And pre exilic Hebrew studying is very important so you can understand the true elements of the language based on the culture and not by its theology. All right, so let's move forward. The summary. After we learn all of this, now you'll see that this cannot have been written by a European because we have Semitic and Hellenistic. Hellenistic, as we see, is very abstract. It deals with appearances. Semitic is more indigenous. It deals with things in the environment. And this is the difference between the two. So after going through this primer, and again, this was not extensive study, I pulled from various sources to try and streamline and condense within two hours the entire Hebrew language, which would take weeks and months to actually teach, especially when it comes to vocalization. But I gave you all the major components that you need to be able to, to go back to the text and see it from a different lens because it starts to make sense. It starts to be more Aboriginal, more indigenous, and it's less European, and it's less Hellenistic. So with that said, fam, I'm done with the summary. I'm gonna wrap it up. All right. Uh, thank y'all for your time. And uh, whoa, we're gonna, we gonna get it in later. We're gonna talk, chat, we're gonna get it in later. So um, Shalom, Hotep, and Black Power, fam. Black Power.